We hope you enjoy Over My Dead Body, which can be streamed as a TV series on Amazon Prime. And thanks to Anchor, we are now also a podcast. According to my children, podcasts have become really popular. And Anchor is hands down the easiest way for anybody to make a podcast. First of all, it's totally free. As in really, really free. Secondly, they provide creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And once you've recorded your masterpiece, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. If that wasn't enough, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor has everything you need to make a podcast, all in one place, and that is exactly why my show is here. Want to make your life simple? Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, I'm Marty Krizwanis, and this is Over My Dead Body, the only talk show that brings to life the most influential people from our history and culture. Today, we are joined by one of the most, if not the most, influential female comics of all time. In our studio today is a trailblazer and a beloved icon, the remarkable Phyllis Diller. We typically conduct our interviews in a cemetery, but we would do anything to accommodate the marvelous Miss Diller. You're off to a good start. Thanks, and welcome to our show. We're honored to have such a comedic genius here with us this morning. You're too kind. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I apologize for the inconvenience. I would have liked to have been buried, but they told me I would have taken up the whole lot, plus most of the highway. (laughs) Your ashes were said to be scattered over the Pacific Ocean. Is that correct? Yes, I was told that was the only place they could fit me and my ex-mother-in-law. If I had known the whale was going to follow me into the afterlife, I would have brought a goddamn harpoon with me. (laughs) Seriously, not even the ocean is big enough for me and that cow. So here I am. Sharp as ever, I see. Would you mind sharing your story with our viewers? Not at all. I was born in Lima, Ohio. My parents were Perry and Francis, and they were older when they had me. I was an only child and never considered myself to be necessarily funny. I was very quiet in school, and on dates I let the boys do all the talking. That's how I landed my first husband. How did you meet your first love? I was studying classical piano for a while, but ended up transferring schools. That's when I met Sherwood. I dropped out and we were married in 1939. So you were a housewife prior to your career. Was that the plan? Yes, I was a mother of five beautiful children. I know this face seems like it would be the perfect birth control. But when it's last call at the bar and you've got a vagina and a heartbeat. (laughs) Did you find raising kids hard? Let's just say we spend the first 12 months of our children's lives teaching them to walk and talk. And then the next 12 months teaching them to sit down and shut up. So you were consumed with housework? Not really. I figured cleaning your house while your kids are still growing is like shoveling the sidewalk before it stops snowing. You eventually went from housewife to comedian, actress, author, musician, and artist. How exactly did you make your big break into the industry? I've been in showbiz since 1955. My first husband practically threw me into the audition room. He originally tried to push me into a grave he had dug, but I didn't fit. No surprise there. Anyway, I always said I became a stand-up comedian because I had a sit-down husband. That led me to my first job at 37 as a female comic at the Purple Onion in San Francisco. My two-week gig turned into 89 weeks. Once I set my mind to something, there's just no stopping me. (laughs) (laughs) Your career has certainly proven that to be true. Now, you were married twice, but you never wed your last partner. Would you say that you're opposed to marriage these days? Well, my first husband was basically my manager until we divorced. He was really just a piece of shit. I was quite unhappy. But I got five children out of it, so at least I can say it was good for something. 
Cheating on him was a lot of fun, however. I gave him the same birthday gift every year. Sloppy seconds. I see. My second husband, Ward. Now that stung a bit more. He turned out to be a bisexual alcoholic. It's not his fault that he was attracted to me. The gays adore me. And in his defense, I do resemble a man. I mean, having sex with me is like screwing a piece of sandpaper in a clown wig and then throwing a feathered gown onto it while you're at it. <laughs> with your second husband, the two of you actually got married, divorced, remarried, and then re-divorced. I learned one thing from him. Never go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. Like I said, the man was bisexual and a drunk. One night he would think I was a man, the next he would think I was a woman. It worked for him. When you came into the industry, comedy was strictly male-dominated. Why do you think you were able to become so successful as a woman? You know, I think I just immediately fit in with the other men. When you have this little sex appeal and this much chest hair, you've got to use that to your advantage. And the cigarette holder? Men hold their dicks. I held a cigarette holder. Actually, it was just a prop. I never smoked, but back then it was the thing to do. The cigarette holder certainly added to your presence. But you seemed to really sparkle on the stage with all those glamorous costumes. Now that was just sweat and grease, sweetheart. I used to work as a friar at an all-night diner. <laughs> you make fun of your appearance a great deal. However, you were very conscious of it. If you're referring to my many plastic surgeries, you can say it. I'm very proud of them. The American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery actually gave you an award for being so open about plastic surgery. You've had two nose jobs, three facelifts, a chemical peel, a breast reduction, cheek implants, an eyeliner tattoo, and bonded teeth. Why do you think you were so attracted to cosmetic surgery? I think I just got sick of getting so many splinters from dragging my boobs around the hardwood. I underwent 15 surgeries. I like to say I have my face renewed and recycled. <laughs> I wouldn't take a single surgery back. I love the way I look. If it builds your self-esteem, I say go for it. Was it really that hard for you to get a date? When you look like a broom with a perm and you've got a cackle like mine, men just assume you're a witch. I once went on a blind date that ended with me being tied to a tree and set on fire. Hottest date I've ever been on. Sounds like it. During your career, you were in over 40 films, several television series, and you even did voice acting. How did you find the motivation to work until the age of 90? I read this book, The Magic of Believing. I would say I owe everything to it. If you don't believe in yourself, how can you expect anyone else to? I had a very dear friend, terribly ugly, but a good friend nonetheless. She told me comedy just wasn't my thing. I told her to kiss my white afro bush. <laughs> As a comic legend, what advice would you give female comedians today? Well, I'd say use what works for you and keep going. That Amy Schumer girl talks a lot about her vagina and it works. The only time anyone ever asked to see my vagina was at the gynecologist. Your entire career was a continuous climb to the top of the industry. Can you take us through those steps? Sure. I became a copywriter to keep the family afloat since my husband had fused his ass to our couch. And then I went into broadcasting. I had this local show, Phyllis Dillis, The Homely Friend Maker where I would give terrible, I mean absolutely awful advice to homemakers. That I would have done for free. So you started to enjoy comedy from that point? I started to realize that I could make people genuinely laugh. After that was done with, I auditioned for the Purple Onion and everything just sort of took off. Once you find your calling, it all just comes naturally. It's evident that comedy came quite naturally to you. You're known for your wild hair, wooden cigarette prop, and embellished attire. I was wondering, is that all you, or is that just a part of the act? As I said, I never smoked a day in my life. I know hard to believe with my perfect Mediterranean olive skin. That was in fact just a prop. My hair was actually accidental. A home bleaching gone wrong. And the flashy oversized clothing? 
Well, between us, I actually have a pretty great rack. But if you want to play a man's game, you've got to look the part. The baggy clothing helped me fit in, made me look flat all around. So it was all just part of your act? Well, yes, the whole persona, as a matter of fact. In 1968, I read a cartoon in the local paper called The Lockhorns of Levittown. That was about a couple who constantly argue. The husband drinks too much, the wife shops too much, they make fun of their neighbors. Really the opposite of the perfect family you see portrayed on television. So that was your inspiration? Yes, I made up the character of my husband, called him Fang, and complained about him throughout my act. I also poked fun at my cooking, while in real life I'm a pretty good cook. People responded to it, and others like Roseanne Barr and Joan Rivers keep it going. But it all started with the Lockhorns comic strip. You were also known to be very close with Bob Hope. How did the two of you meet? I was performing on The Tonight Show with Jack Parr. I remember looking out into the crowd, and there he was, watching me, of all people. I couldn't believe it. I mean, there was the Bob Hope. I was absolutely obsessed with him and his work. He was my idol. So he just happened to be in the audience? Actually, he came to the show to see me specifically. That was one of the few times in my life someone came for me. <laughs> and he loved your performance. He looked at me and said, you are great. That's when I knew I could go far. If a legend like Bob Hope believes in you, you better goddamn believe in yourself. I read that you actually wrote your own stand-up material. And in 2003... You donated a steel cabinet with 48 drawers to the Smithsonian with all your jokes. More than 50,000 of them, all on index cards. I had to write them myself. If anyone else could have done my sets, they'd already be doing it. When I came into this career, I didn't have the luxury of female role models, so I mimicked men. Sid Caesar, Milton Berle, Jonathan Winters. Those are some spectacular influences. You were famously known for your self-deprecating humor. Why do you think that came so naturally to you? Wow, hard to say, Marty. Maybe if you had a face like the end of a burnt cigarette, you'd understand. <laughs> oh, come on. You're a beautiful woman. Look, Marty, darling, if you're trying to be husband number three, just say the word. I just meant... Relax, I knew what you meant. I always thought using the audience for the joke was a scapegoat anyway. It's funny to watch a performer be so shamelessly self-aware. We don't make fun of ourselves enough, and well, I was such an easy target. Rodney Dangerfield was the best at it. I have to mention this. I recently heard that the one and only Barbara Streisand was your opening act at the Bonsoir in Greenwich Village. What was that like? She was absolutely fabulous. I truly appreciate women who can really hone their craft like that. She had the crowd crying by the time I got on that stage. Crying of laughter, of course. That schnoz really warmed them up. You were also a best-selling author. You published your first bestseller, Phyllis Diller's Housekeeping Hints, in 1966. You then went on to write Phyllis Diller's Marriage Manual, The Complete Mother, The Joys of Aging and How to Avoid Them, and Like a Lampshade in a Whorehouse, My Life in Comedy. You must have been passionate about writing. I still am. Comes really naturally, like writing stand-up. I basically just followed the golden rule. Write what you know. I wrote about marriage, children, growing up. It flowed out of me because it was real life. It was genuine, and it was relatable. And, of course, you added in your incredible sense of humor, which, I have to say, created a multi-dimensional read. I write how I speak, so I was hoping the readers would get a laugh or two out of it. I found it interesting that in your autobiography, you mentioned that you had a terribly unhappy childhood. You stated that your parents were quite cold and that your first marriage was a nightmare. Do you think those factors helped you in your career? I think many comedians thrive off of some sort of trauma. I believe that I was traumatized right from birth. How's that? Well, when I first came out, I was so hairy and monstrous they had animal control on standby. <laughs> Comedy is the music that we can all sing to, even in our darkest hours. I think that's a beautiful outlook. Of course, it's hard to sing and dance with these flabby arms. Once I start, I just start flying away like a winged bat. Now, we know that you're a true jack-of-all-trades. 
I read that you appeared as a piano soloist with several symphony orchestras between 1971 and 1981. Do you feel that you abandoned music too early in life? Those were wonderful times. I've always had such an admiration for music. I don't believe that I ever abandoned it. I just found stand-up to be livelier. And you performed under the name Dame Ilya Dilia. <laughs> yes. I played a diva who took an eternity before she even touched the keys. I'd clean the piano, check the score, the lighting, anything to prolong the performance. You were known as a fine concert pianist with a firm touch. People were quite stunned by your musical talent outside of your life of comedy. With looks like mine, you gotta either have talent or personality. Just ask Bette Midler. <laughs> you practically stole the entire show. And Groucho's no amateur comedian either. Well, I think that everyone expected to see a housewife. Groucho gave me the opportunity to show them an entertainer. I'm sure you're gonna make a big success in show business. And I think you made a very wise decision. Seems like you called that one pretty early on, huh? Excellent imitation, Marty. You just gave me goosebumps. Not an easy thing to do, being that I'm dead. Yes, I was very honored to hear that, and still consider it a great compliment. You know, there was no crazy clothing, no wacky hair. It was just me up there. It gave me a great deal of confidence in the beginning to go forward and feel free to embellish my act. If no one tells you that you're funny in the beginning, you'll never make it. That actually brings me to my next question. Do you feel that without those embellishments, that people truly would have found you less funny? You know, I talk a lot about my appearance, as we all know. When I decided that I was going to pursue this career path, I knew that no one was going to laugh at a sexy, big-boobed comedian. No one is going to pay attention to the words coming out of my mouth if they're distracted by my physique or face. I mean, I was lucky that I didn't have to worry about the face part. So, so you hid your body so that people would take your comedy seriously? Precisely. Between the two of us, I actually did a nude photo shoot for Playboy in the 90s. I mean, we were going for funny, but I know this may be a shock to a lot of people. It just looked like a sexy spread. Well, that was what Playboy said. It looked more like a spread of three-month-old salami, if you ask me. That's quite an image. On top of all the creative side projects you've accomplished, many people may not know you're also a very talented self-taught artist. I always enjoyed creating, so that was kind of just thrown into the mix. I started painting around 1963. Watercolors, acrylics, oils, you name it. I did a lot of fun, wacky portraits and still lifes. Filling the house with artwork brought it to life, gave it character. I know that comedy is second nature to you. Were you the same way with your art? Art truly just came right out of my veins, just like my ex-husband's words would fly straight out of their asses. <laughs> <laughs> and at 86, you actually held parties where you sold your artwork, as well as your stage clothes and jewelry. I thought maybe there's another broad out there who wants a self-portrait of me to remind them they aren't so hideous. Things could be worse. Speaking of the arts, aside from the piano, you were a wonderful singer as well. Did you enjoy those performances? Very much. I remember I had such a wonderful time performing I Feel Pretty. I think that was 1966. I just feel that it all goes together. Music, art, performance, comedy. You even once said, if you can't dance the comedy, forget it. It's music. That's a great perspective. Well, it's true. Humor is the music of life. If we can't laugh at all the bullshit, then what? On the topic of music, in 2012, you recorded a version of Charlie Chaplin's Smile with Thomas Lauderdale for the Get Happy album. I have to ask, is there anything you can't do? I don't half-ass anything. If I was going to commit to the industry, I was going to stay devoted. I was constantly busy traveling, making music, doing stand-up, interviews, painting. People take breaks from their careers these days. I don't know what that even means. You want a break? Go grab a cup of coffee. If you want success, you have to go out there and earn it yourself. I don't just get laughs. I work for them every single day. Of course, now I'm at the age where my back goes out more than I do. Understood. You were also known for voicing several animated characters throughout the years. You were in the Scooby-Doo films, Hey Arnold, The Powerpuff Girls, and Jimmy Neutron, to name a few. Another well-known character you played was Thelma, Peter Griffin's mother on Family Guy. The show is still airing new episodes to this day. 
I truly thought it was brilliant. That Seth MacFarlane is a genius. Okay, who is more likely to fit into their pants after Thanksgiving? Peter Griffin or Fang's mother? For those who may not know, Fang jokes were a major part of your act. Between drawing from the comic strip character and having two douchebags for a spouse, it made comedy a breeze. Anyway, the answer is Griffin. I should have guessed that. Would you mind taking some calls from our viewers? I'd love to. The only person who ever rang my phone was my plastic surgeon to tell me he was running a special. Caller one, you're on. Miss Diller, this is Mr. Ellis from New York. Oh, Miss Diller, it's such an honor. I have to ask, is it true that after you and your first husband divorced, his mother and sister sued you for defamation of character for speaking so poorly about them in your act? Let me put it this way. I only referred to those two as Moby Dick and Captain Bly. As far as I'm concerned, those were completely fictional characters that I was referring to. Let's just say it didn't take long for them to settle out of court. I was also wondering, Bob Hope once called you a Warhol mobile of spare parts picked up along a freeway. Do you take that as a compliment? Oh, absolutely. Never heard a more accurate description of myself in my life. Would you say that you owe any of your success to Bob? I don't believe you can truly owe your success to anyone aside from yourself. I mean, it takes talent, guts, perseverance, and of course, blowjobs. With that being said, Bob truly did give me a great deal of help to jumpstart my career. At 37 years old, I certainly benefited from that. He saw something in me that no one else did. What would you say you took away from your friendship with Mr. Hope? What didn't I take away? He was one of the finest people I'd ever known. The kindest, gentlest, purest soul. I would say he is certainly a large part as to why I have continued to stay so positive in my endeavors. Plus, we screwed each other's brains out for decades, with me usually on top. The last time I saw him, he said, Thanks for the memories. <laughs> in 2002, you decided to retire from stand-up. How did you come to that decision to finally throw in the towel? I never really threw away the towel. I always kept it by my bedside for obvious reasons. <laughs> I just mean... My last performance was at the Suncoast in Vegas. A very delightful crowd. At the end of the day, it was just a matter of energy. In order to do what I do, I need to be on 24-7. While I still have my drive, I just didn't have the stamina to continue. The quality wouldn't have been up to my standards, and if I couldn't do my act to its fullest extent, well, then I'd rather not do it at all, which is completely different from my perspective on sex. I imagine that must have been a hard realization to come to. I had a fabulous, lengthy career, but I knew it was time to step down, and I was extremely content with my body of work. Being content with my physical body, on the other hand, that's another story. I have so many liver spots, I ought to come with a side of onions. <laughs> Would you care to take another call? A Mrs. Phillips from Tennessee. Sure, I've got some time, right? Hi, Miss Diller. My question to you is, well, we all have our favorite Phyllis Diller lines, but I was wondering, what are your favorites? Well, I wrote about 50,000 of them, but if you put a gun to my head and made me tell you my favorites, it'd go something like this. The reason women don't play football is because 11 of them would never wear the same outfit in public. I admit I have a tremendous sex drive. My boyfriend lives 40 miles away. I want my children to have all the things I couldn't afford. Then I want to move in with them. I once wore a peekaboo blouse. People would peek and then they'd boo. A bachelor is a guy who never made the same mistake once. What I don't like about office Christmas parties is looking for a job the next day. My cooking was so bad my kids thought Thanksgiving was to commemorate Pearl Harbor. I'm 18 years behind in my ironing. There's no use doing it now. It doesn't fit anybody I know. Nothing was happening in my marriage. I nicknamed our waterbed Lake Placid. The best contraceptive for old people is nudity. I've been asked to say a couple of words about my husband, Fang. How about short and cheap? His finest hour lasted a minute and a half. Tranquilizers work only if you follow the advice on the bottle. Keep away from children. Always be nice to your children, because they are the ones who will choose your rest home. Those are fantastic. Does it feel rewarding to receive such praise from other comedy legends? Of course. You know, being a comedian is difficult. 
It takes a brave soul to stand up in front of an entire crowd and accept the kind of ridicule or judgment that inevitably comes with the territory. I have such respect for other comedians, no matter how acclaimed. That being said, when given compliments by tremendously talented comedians whose work I am so blown away by, it's quite surreal. On an unpleasant note, after your 80th birthday, you began to suffer from several illnesses. In 1999, your heart stopped, causing you to be fitted with a pacemaker. Shortly after, you suffered from a bad drug reaction that caused you to be paralyzed. After going through multiple traumas, how were you able to persevere? Being paralyzed did have one benefit. I could finally have anal sex. <laughs> Phyllis, you're too much. You were eventually able to walk again, correct? If you thought I was going to let a drug reaction or anal sex slow me down, you're dead wrong. I did what the physical therapist told me to, and was back to being me in no time. Well said. Unfortunately, another mishap in 2007 forced you to cancel your appearance on The Tonight Show, where you were going to celebrate your 90th birthday. Right, I fractured my back at a group orgy. Hey, every situation comes with a risk. <laughs> And your final interview was in 2012 in your hometown. Yes, I was accepting my Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm very proud of that one. You can go home again. You passed away at the age of 95 in your home in Brentwood. Do you wish you'd done anything differently? I probably could have fit another marriage in, another boob job, maybe one more facelift. Truly, I lived my life to the beat of my own drum. I accomplished everything I set out to do, even raised five kids. Wouldn't wish anything had gone differently. I died with a full and happy heart and an empty bladder. I believe I pissed myself at the end, but my memory's a bit foggy. People were devastated by your passing. Comedian Joan Rivers paid tribute to your career by saying, She was the first one who showed the anger that is in all of us. And that's what made it so funny. Because she spoke for all these women who were sitting home with a bunch of children and a husband that didn't work. Ah, Joni, such a sweet thing, that one. We've always bonded over that topic. Well, that and safe sex. How's that? Joan Rivers and I agreed that the best way to have safe sex was to lock the car door. Anyway, the two of us combined are the reason why there are so many new wings in hospitals all over the world. <laughs> Do you have time for one last caller, Miss Diller? Mr. Thompson from Boston. Well, I've got a meeting at 12, but I can push it back. Yeah, hi. We ever going to see that Playboy shoot? I mean, it's bad enough you had such a nice rack and never showed it off. I definitely would have bought tickets for your show if I knew I was going to see some nip. And I would have sex with you when I was alive if I thought I was going to feel some tip. But I can tell just by your voice that there wouldn't be much to feel. Touché. I should know better than to spar with you. Hey, Phyllis. I've read everywhere that you were the very first female stand-up comedian. I'm glad you can read. You even wrote that on the back of your autobiography. But I really think you're leaving out Loretta. Loretta who? Why, Loretta Mary Aiken from North Carolina. Name doesn't ring a bell. She went by the stage name of Moms Mabley. She started doing stand-up in 1919, when you were two years old. So your whole bullshit story about being the first female stand-up comic has been exposed. Can you feel the tip now? <laughs> I apologize for that last caller. It's okay. I had it coming. I guess I took George Bernard Shaw's saying to heart. Life isn't about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. Mom's Mabley was black, and back then, blacks weren't given credit for much, especially on television. People referred to me as the first female stand-up, and I didn't correct them. For the record, Mom's Mabley was the very first female stand-up comedian, so please accept my apologies. So, what's next on the horizon? For the last few months, I've been writing a new set, you know, about being dead and all. It's a topic I have yet to bring up. I didn't want to scare anyone. But I think it's time to show people that being dead isn't so bad. We can still love and laugh and even eat without caring about the pounds. Although people still try to send me to the pound. <laughs> I bet it'll be fantastic. Do you think this interview has possibly helped push that agenda at all? All right, don't toot your own horn. I do think this interview has shown me that it's time to finally finish the set. Maybe they'll release it as one of those Netflix specials everyone and their mother seems to get. 
Actually, I'll try for Amazon. They seem to be popping off, as the kids would say. Well, I can certainly tell you that the entire world, including myself, would absolutely adore hearing the phenomenal Phyllis Stiller perform once more. Any final thoughts for the viewers tuning in? Life is too short to live unhappily. Take it from me. Don't wait. Go after your dreams. Laugh, dance, and get the damn tummy tuck. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Good night. I love you. And we love you, Phyllis. I'm Marty Kriswanis, and we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of Over My Dead Body. We hope you enjoyed the eighth episode of Over My Dead Body. The entire TV series is now available as a podcast, in addition to streaming on Amazon Prime. Aside from Phyllis Diller, we've interviewed Robert Kardashian, Nostradamus, Steve Jobs, Mae West, Richard Nixon, Julia Child, and Tupac Shakur. Upcoming guests include Walter Cronkite, Mark Twain, Howard Cosell, Sigmund Freud, Jimmy Stewart, Albert Einstein, Jack Lemmon, Lucille Ball, and Red Fox. All told, we plan to produce 60 episodes, and perhaps as many as 300 of them. One thing's for certain, there's no shortage of interesting guests, and more seem to arrive every day. Over My Dead Body was created and written by Stephen Kunis, who serves as the executive producer. This episode was hosted, produced, directed, and edited by yours truly, Marty Kriswanis. And yes, I also wrote and performed the catchy theme music. Phyllis Diller was portrayed by Amy Geronimi, a woman of many talents and voices. Very special thanks go to Norman Lear for his encouragement in the development of this show and to the late, great Johnny Carson for suggesting that a talk show with a fantasy guest list, whether dead or alive, would be a wonderful idea.